Welcome to Water Sessions, a Water Council podcast. Mention any risk anywhere in the world and you'll find a connection to water. We explore water challenges and the future of water innovation with experts in the water community, sharing stories and perspectives that you won't hear anywhere else. A special thanks to our series sponsor, RexNord, a global leader of advanced water management solutions and smart technologies. RexNord solves smarter for its customers to deliver hygienic, safe, and efficient products that protect human health and the environment. Additional support is provided by today's session sponsor, Corvius. And now, the host of today's water session, Dean Amhaus. Hello, and welcome to the Water Council's latest Water Sessions podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Greg Canito, who has the distinct role of being the solutions innovator for a company that you probably are not familiar with called Corvius. Corvius is rooted in the Latin phrase, by way of the heart. This phrase serves as a daily reminder for the company to lead with their hearts through every one of their partnerships. Corvius is working with the U.S. Army and U.S. Air Force in 15 partnerships across nine states by managing $100 billion in deferred maintenance for more than 500,000 facilities or 42.3 million gross square feet. Just to give you a sort of an understanding of that, that's over 8,000 miles or going from the East Coast to the West Coast, back to the East Coast, and almost back to the West Coast United States. The firm's military focus is to provide integrated development, construction, and property management for the housing of America's service members and their families. If that's not enough to keep them busy, Corvius also works with 15 different universities across the U.S., including California State University, Purdue, Notre Dame, and Georgia State. To dive into any of those topics would be a fascinating exploration, but our focus today is on an entirely additional area for Corvius, and that is their work with federal, state, and municipal governments, and in particular, designing the operation and maintenance of stormwater systems. With all of this under Corvius care, I can understand why, Greg, you have the title of Solutions Innovator. Greg has been working in the Corvius over 20 years, and it proudly served in the U.S. Marine Corps for several years. Greg, welcome to today's session. Thanks, Dean. It's uh, great to be here. We appreciate it. So hopefully I captured a little bit of Corvius correctly. I really was amazed at how far and extensive your work is. It's a pretty large in terms of your footprint in service areas, and it really is being able to help as a public-private entity. But Could you describe a little bit more in terms of your involvement around water infrastructure in particular? Thank you again for allowing me to be here and inviting me to participate. You did a great job (laughs) with uh, introducing us. We're not a household name, but we have been around for over 20 years. And as you said, we have a significant amount of assets that we have under our management in the infrastructure world. And you covered the what really well, but you also, which a lot of people don't do, is take the time to uh, discuss what's very important to us, which is the how. We took such an effort to develop a name and put the Latin derivatives together of core and via for by way of the heart, because we get the privilege to be the custodian in these long-term contractual partnerships with the United States Army, United States Air Force, Notre Dame, the Georgia State University system. Prince George's County, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewer District, to really be a custodial role in helping them develop, maintain their infrastructure backlog. We're behind the scenes, but like you said, we play a pretty big role. And how we do it has really been doing it in a way that really focuses on the public good outcome. Infrastructure for these institutions is a means to an end. It is the means to provide a public service for these institutions and to be able to participate with them is uh, fantastic. But what you'll find and we'll discuss further is how you develop solutions to adapt to their ever-changing environment, especially in the water sector where the environmental and regulatory mandates are ever increasing while the revenues and resources are ever decreasing. (laughs) So it creates a lot of stress and pressure, but it also creates, you know, necessity is the mother of all innovation. We do take that solutions provider approach, and this is all driven by our sole owner and sole founder, John Pisern, who has 
driven this focus and approach to how we engage our public partners and, and adapt to their needs. It's a really good point in terms of it starts at the top and then obviously it is interjected through the entire staff of Corvius and then spreads out throughout the community. So let's turn a little bit more on to the, again, that water infrastructure piece. And you touched upon it a little bit, that tug, and it's, it's even actually more than a tug, it's a real push. People are wanting more and more environmental solutions. As you said, the, the budgets are tight. So how do you come in to work on this? And I know you mentioned in the past is about Prince George's County. Explain a little bit of that, your work with them and how this occurs. The industry trends, especially in the water and the environment nexus, has been a traditionally a stick type approach that the EPA has been perceived as providing a stick. And I would say about five to seven years ago, you started to see a lot of shifts towards how can you incentivize or create more of a carrot approach to complement the regulatory stick. It's very important to have those regulations, but how do you start to relieve some of that pressure and, and, and be more collaborative to work with these institutions who are regulated, your municipal governments who have competing priorities on their services. And we actually ended up working collaboratively with the EPA. As you said, we manage already existing 8,000 miles of infrastructure. We're actually co-permittees with the United States Army, United States Air Force on the environmental management and specifically the stormwater management on a lot of their bases. So we were already active in this conversation, but it was really more in just that reactionary regulatory reporting, making sure nothing blows up. And we actually got into a conversation with the EPA because we had a notice of violation in Oklahoma. So we were being regulated and we were able to solve the regulation financially as well as technically very, very quickly. And the EPA actually said, how'd you do that? And for me personally, I ended up sitting in a uh, round table with the EPA that ended up turning into about a year and a half of ad hoc meetings where we made an agreement. I told them I know nothing of the science, so you need, they need to teach me the science and we will teach you the financial economic mechanisms in which private sector can partner better with public sector. So we'll be your economist and you be our scientist. And we had some collaborative discussions. In that discussion, Prince George's County, which had always been an innovator or leader, Larry Kaufman was at that time the uh, assistant director of the Department of Environment for uh, Prince George's County. And he had been a leader in a green infrastructure, low impact development in the 90s and early 2000s. And he was now at the county. And Prince George's County was a municipality that was in need of a change. And mm -hmm. you had a new leadership with uh, Rashern Baker as a new county executive. And, Adam, and he selected Adam Ortiz, who was a former mayor of Edmondson, Maryland to be his director of uh, environment. And unique to Adam, Adam had done the first Green Street in Edmonston in a collaboration with Prince George's County in the early 2000s. And so you can see how these dynamics were coming together at Prince George's County. As a government, they really needed change. They really needed to spur a catalyst in their municipality. And they also needed to build more credibility, not just with their constituents, but with their stakeholders at the federal and state levels. And they took the uh, risk to issue out a uh, what was being developed at the time as a community-based public-private partnership solicitation. And they went to the market and asked for the private sector to bid on this. And ourselves, recognizing that they were looking for something different, really the water industry is not necessarily looking for the traditional public-private partnership, but they are looking for private sector to partner differently with them. And uniquely, the stormwater there needs to be a community aspect, not just an engagement, but a true integration with the community. When we first got selected, we had the right team and we had a good approach. And I think we won on our philosophy and our approach on the how of running these large programs. But when we sat down, the first comment, and I've heard this before from civic leaders was, stormwater for stormwater's sake will not be good enough. Stormwater integrated in this community that creates an economic engine that helps create greater education, obviously, but also tangible jobs, tangible work, tangible expertise in it, not just education of why it's important, but tangible expertise in the community of how to build it and maintain it is what they're looking for. We partnered with them to do 2000 acres of retrofits as part of their MS4 permit regulations. The MS4 
is the municipal separate storm sewer system requirements for regulated communities that do not have a combined sewer, but have a separate sewer system from their stormwater system to handle flooding and, and, and storm events. Interesting is how you sort of got into this line of business was going back to a violation in Oklahoma. You start getting connected with EPA folks. They learn about you. You get knowledgeable. And all of a sudden, you've got a whole other line of business, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, we had it was complimentary because we were already managing stormwater as an owner. And we had sure. an, contracts that are 50, 60 years. And doing that on federal property is always a... Uh, fascinating because of the historical <laughs> environmental conditions. But yeah, yeah, it was a whole new customer base that opened up to us. The local municipal regulated marketplace is more known now over the past 10 years, but traditionally is an unknown marketplace. I think a lot of people right. think stormwater is drainage for development, but there's a really complex, very important regulated marketplace that allows for the redevelopment of communities in the municipal stormwater marketplace around clean water and, and volume management. Well, and what it comes down to really, and, and you talked about this as naming off the individuals up in Prince George's County. And for you know those who are listening, this is right next to Washington, D.C. So an area of the country that is growing rapidly and expanding. But you've got leaders who have a united vision It was a vision that said it's not just dealing with the stormwater, but here is an economic opportunity for our community. And that was a big shift for you, I'm sure, that a lot of folks look at it as sort of how do we deal with the problem instead of looking at it as a possible opportunity, correct? Yeah, no, it was taking a mandate and turning it into an opportunity. And and I'm glad you picked up on that, Dean, is uh, I will usually reference the new leadership or stakeholders that were brought into this conversation. And that's what we're trying to drive towards going forward. County executives, mayors, executive director levels of stakeholders in the community, recognizing stormwater as a critical component of their economy. You never hear about communities with clean water or that don't have a water crisis having economic development issues. You do hear about communities that have water crisis and there is a direct connection to economic crisis when a community has either on the supply side or the sewer side, the treatment side, if you have a water crisis, it significantly contracts your ability to economically grow as a community. So the introduction of more senior leadership and stakeholder into the dialogue and into the vested interest of the stormwater program is one of the big differences that we tried and purposely as we got into this marketplace, we're not a traditional engineering firm. We don't right. sell on the engineering or the or the construction. And so we were really introducing and trying to introduce a new layer to the chessboard. Because what you're saying, too, is that oftentimes, and I, in fact, I just heard that this week, people come in and say, clean up my river or clean up my lake. But that's looking at the puzzle just with one piece. you got to look at that whole picture because it's the community engagement and how our businesses and citizens involved with it. And so a utility or a government may only look at it from that small little angle, whereas you come in and look at it from a holistic standpoint. Yeah, traditionally, and what's been great is you see the stormwater utility fees has gotten, like a, I think there's been a 200% growth since 2009 in the number of communities that have a stormwater utility fee, which is a, a great recognition of the community accepting even a new revenue source to apply to stormwater. But what's even more important is you're seeing that the stormwater utility work or departments are coming out from under the traditional Department of Public Works umbrella and being more having their own identity and understanding their role in, to your point, clean up the river. Well, why is it important to clean up the river? Well, because the city's economic base was founded on being on that river port (laughs) or, you know, from a fundamental transportation and economics aspect. So let's not ruin the river. And it's not just clean up the river once it's let's keep it clean. So trying to, you know, really trying to bring that into the economic context. You make an interesting point about how these communities were developed sometimes hundreds of years ago 
around the water and the lake. And then over time, at least it happened here in Milwaukee, the rivers became polluted and we sort of turned our backs to the river. And we didn't want to see it, we didn't want to smell it. And just that flip around of you got to address the problem at the front end. And all of a sudden that facing away from the river now facing towards, and you're seeing huge economic development going on with apartments and businesses and restaurants and so on. I think what Corvius brings in is that community engagement and education, which I was really impressed. And I know when we talked earlier, you were telling me a story about a police or a fire chief Mm -hmm. that got in front of some public forum and was talking about the importance of having a stormwater network. That's the first I ever heard of something like this. Tell us that story. I've had to stand in line for community forums behind police and fire chiefs who have very compelling needs around safety. And all of a sudden I have to stand up and then make the case for stormwater. In particular, one was in uh, Los Angeles and the fire department relies heavily on stormwater to fight forest fires. I've been behind police chiefs who have talked about crime and the need for more police officers or just investment for safety initiatives, et cetera. And it's always tough following up in the city of, and I was in the city of Chester and there's a significant amount of crime. So how do you, in a community that has a significant amount of needs and there's only so much to give from the community, from a revenue standpoint, how do you prioritize these things and get stormwater to be in that priority? And hearing fire chiefs and police chiefs start to support the stormwater program because the spaces create greater safety. We're able to put cameras or integrate safety. To them, it is a location. To the fire department chief, it is a resource to help fight safety issues. And then, especially in the Northeast, it's public spaces that are better organized, that are cleaner, and that you can incorporate some public safety there. That's what we've been able to take the stormwater program to do. City of Chester is where we have a partnership, and uh, the focus has been around a lot of the inlets in their combined sewer and also trying to incorporate safety at those locations because it's very fragmented and pervasive throughout the entire community. So you can find some synergies. And that's what I say again about stormwater for stormwater's sake will never be good enough, but stormwater infrastructure is foundational to every community. We all like to stay dry and there's opportunities to integrate it with the other economic engines or economic priorities and municipal services. But that's not just intergovernmental agency integration. It still needs to have its own unique financial structuring and it still needs to pay for its goods and services and and its requirements. And so how you incorporate that, but also incorporate long-term maintenance and some of the financial efficiencies and delivery efficiencies, because your police chief and your fire chief do not want to own it or maintain it. (laughs) Right. It's definitely, they're vested and they can see the connection and they're looking for any value add they can get in their community, but they also aren't looking for any new burdens or new jobs. So you're talking about public officials and and police and fire chiefs advocating for more stormwater solutions, but you also involve faith-based organizations Mm -hmm. and really building that as part of your community partners. Yeah, so that goes back to the Prince George's County. So we were uh, 2,000 acres of retrofits, which equates to a little over 100 individual stormwater projects. And it's not just about putting projects for project's sake, but actually how do you master plan through the various communities? And we identified the faith-based community, especially in Prince George's County, as a pipeline into the community. Churches are well dispersed throughout neighborhoods, low income and high income. In a lot of cases, the faith-based communities are a central meeting place, kind of informal town hall. And also what was traditionally faux pas was to put a fee on a nonprofit institution who doesn't pay property tax. We were able, and Adam Ortiz led this from the public side, but was able to organize the faith-based community leadership to adopt green infrastructure as part of God's Green's Earth message, I Mm -hmm. guess. The first program we worked with and architected was a faith-based alternative compliance program, which we would reduce their fee. And all they had to agree to was incorporate the education and messaging around stormwater into their Sunday. So the Sunday services were talking about stormwater? We, uh, Corby's employees would even go in and meet with some of the Sunday kids, Sunday school sessions and talk about the stormwater and the stormwater being put in their parking lot. So they would also get projects 
And in order to be able to offer that, you had to make it really efficient. And you also had to get them as property owners to agree to let you tear up their parking lot or their front yard. And so there was a lot of integration and customer service. And I think that's where also private sector, where we provided value to uh, Prince George's County was connecting the regulatory, because they still wanted to get regulatory compliance out of those programs, but connecting that to the customer service of what a church or any property owner, and we tested it first on churches, would want on their property. Property owner doesn't necessarily want exactly what the public engineer wants on their landscape. So how do you bridge that and also make it more seamless and uh, customer service centric? I keep on coming back to this idea of just taking care of the water issues. It's almost as though 50 to 60% of your time and energy are all dealing with community engagement and saying, you all are partners with helping to address your community around stormwater issues, and we need you and get our your kids involved and get the adults involved. A very comprehensive approach. Yeah, so on the land side, 80% of the land traditionally in any community is controlled by the private or non-governmental property owners. Uh, public property owners, especially the regulated municipality, typically owns less than 20%, and it's primarily right away. So if you're going to solve the stormwater challenge, you're going to need to get access to your constituents' properties. We believe you have to make a commitment to employing residents and to using local small disadvantaged businesses. Stormwater is a huge potential for uh, small businesses to diversify their capabilities, to learn it, and to be able to participate in the professional and the contractor construction development side of it. So we make a commitment. 50% of all work hours are done by residents. And in Prince George's County, 40% of all the work has to be contracted to a local small mm-hmm. minority advantage business, we're at about 80% plus. But what that does, when you think about, Dean, it's a multi-pronged approach. You have a message going through your community channels about why it's so important, but then you have an entire message going through your business community, how it's an investment by the government on their properties and into their businesses, a tangible investment. And what Corvius, we play a role in structuring that program and helping develop the local contractor base. We have training programs as well as reducing the barriers to entry. So we take on a lot of the bonding or insurance or contracting risk that's very difficult sometimes for small business to government work. And we'll provide that as more of an umbrella that they can subscribe into so that they can compete regularly and faster. I mean, when you talk about small businesses, a owner is out with the crew working during the day and they do their business development a lot of times from like three o'clock till 10 o'clock at night and their books for their business. So we really work with them to be able to make it easy for them to participate and win business in this program. And it really does foster a lot of loyalty, a lot of engagement and pride amongst the community and the business owners. We're very proud in our programs to start establishing anywhere from 50 to 60 plus businesses with local county business owners who are very proud of that piece of their business, of their portfolio. So what you're changing is the paradigm instead of saying you do this is we are doing this and we're doing it together and looking at it from a full expansive, you know, my bet is that your military experience comes in quite handy because you prepare for areas, whether it be a disaster area or war areas where there's just a a lot of devastation and you've got to look at it from a holistic standpoint. Let's transition to Milwaukee because your work going on right now, which is relatively new, you're working with the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District. And just to put things in context, in case of Milwaukee, they say that one inch of rain equals about 7.1 billion gallons of water. I know just this year we've had times where it's been more than one inch. And for the people listening in, if I calculated this correctly, that 7.1 billion is about 11,000 Olympic swimming pools that all of a sudden can hit a place like Milwaukee in a very quick fashion. And MMSD has done some great work on capturing their stormwater, treating their stormwater, and their claim to fame is that they're getting 98% of their wastewater collected in, in their system and treating it. But that's not good enough for them. They want perfection. They want that last 2% or 750 million gallons of water, storm water. 
And they've brought you now in to help them meet that goal, squeezing that little bit out of this. But your engagement is certainly a community involvement, but there's also a really interesting financing model, a pay for performance. Explain what's going on with Milwaukee, both in community engagement, but this pay for performance. What's fascinating about Milwaukee and Milwaukee Metro and Sewer District, they've taken a tremendous, which is a very, I think, uh, progressive approach of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, and that last 2%, it's not just the last 2%, but it's how you do that last 2%. So when you think about it from their perspective, that 98%, they've done a tremendous job by managing, but they have to manage that. And that's a long-term maintenance and a potential for that to, over time, the burden of that. So they, the last 2% is a tremendous opportunity to pilot and, and also solve it in a way that doesn't ever put it into the system that they manage, which is really, really smart. By allowing it to uh, using green infrastructure that takes 750 million gallons and partner with the community for it to be treated where it lands and never actually go into the combined sewer, I think is a really smart initiative and very progressive MMSD team led by Kevin Schaefer. It opens the door for a next generation of what we did at Prince George's County. And what they did is they play a role of the oversight and directing what they want, but then putting the accountability, which is similar to what we've done in Prince George's County, but more fiscal accountability on us in the sense that they buy it once it's built. So they made a commitment to purchase gallons. And their commitment to purchase gallons is to purchase those gallons below their cost of maintaining it with gray infrastructure within their system. What we do is they've given us an initial commitment to purchase eight and a half million gallons. And we go out and we provide the upfront investment to organize the capacity within the community and to assess where all the potential, especially on private properties, opportunities are to capture those gallons bring back those projects, get their approval. There's requirements on the how where we have to utilize certain percentage of local businesses, just like with Prince George's, and distribution of these projects to numerous neighborhoods, not just inside the city of Milwaukee, but around their whole service area. With those requirements, we do an assessment, we bring back, and we take on the at-risk capital that is not financed by the district that once we get their approval on those projects, we build them and they buy those projects per that preset price below what it costs them to maintain in their service system. It's actually really simple when you think about it. It's more traditional where what we worked with MMSD was you outline your demand and your requirements and the private marketplace will react to that by investing in resources and providing you back that supply. But it does take some architecture. It is an introduction of stormwater into the shared economy construct that the Ubers and the Lyfts and the WeWorks, et cetera, follow, which is, you know, if you think about Uber, they've made a tremendous investment so that a driver will be available and you can process that ride to solve the last mile issue of transportation in a community. So we're doing the same thing where we're organizing the capacity so that the capacity is there available to do projects that MMSD wants done. It reminds me of a home developer will go out and buy all the land and might even start doing some initial buildings of homes and and sites and to start enticing customers who will then ultimately pay for them. Is it similar to that kind of structure of you're paying for a lot of that upfront things with a contract that MMSD will say, you meet those uh, achievements, we'll finish it off. Yep, exactly. So that was clear what the public was looking for, what the institution of MMSD was looking for, and to make sure that they are involved in the oversight and the selection. So they still maintain the oversight and control to make sure they get the projects and the assets built that they need but they don't have to put out the financial risk or the financial dollars to take away from their operations in that year and the resources for the procurement, for the management. It's a build to suit. Just like you said with the, with the home builder industry, we've architected a public demand uh, market. We've gone out and architected a market supply of contractors and capacity to make sure it stays local. And it does have a community and a local business development and small business development construct into it. And we finance that structure to be able to deliver those projects without a premium. It's a affordable, efficient 
project, but it's being done now locally. And so by MMSD making that commitment to buy in that construct allows us as a private sector to make that investment in their market to source and develop and build those projects for them to buy the way they want them built, using their local businesses dispersed throughout the community and not just opportunistically throughout the community. And in some ways, if we think about this too, as you know, a utility or a community is so focused on their own local area, but the fact that Corvius is managing 8,000 miles of property out there. So your scale is so much larger and extensive in the network that I don't want to say easier for you, but you can incorporate something of this kind of scale into your overall system, correct? Yes. So strategically as a business model, especially in the water, it was very important when we made our decision not to be vertically integrated. Because if you're vertically integrated and performing not just the kind of what we talk about, the program management, custodial partner aspect and the financing construct, and you're also reliant, you are providing the construction and the maintenance and the trucks and the backhoes and everything of that nature, there is some level of conflict in the sense of you will keep it insular. It is more of a contractor relationship versus an enabler relationship, a custodial relationship. Like you said, we have a great experience and leverage with a larger national firms to be able to organize them to support a local marketplace better and to adopt a lot of these smaller and mid-sized contractors to help them integrate into the construct. If there's anything I could get across, it'd be it, what we're really super excited and it's continuously evolving. It really is a shift from the traditional contractor, you know, mm. plan, design, bid, build a project to a shared economy of shared consumption of stormwater across not just properties, private property owners sharing their property for the public good by putting an asset into it, but by the businesses and the resources that are needed to build those and to participate and opening it up for them to be able to participate much easier with the oversight and boundaries to make sure it's delivered and certified per the regulatory and functional requirements. And what's important about conversations like this, Dean, is for people to really understand that nuanced shift right. of the economic mechanics. I think MMSD is a tremendously progressive organization that really sees itself not just as a service provider in, the, in their 28 areas to communities that they service, but also as an anchor institution in those communities and has a responsibility to think about not just reacting to the latest storm, but how do we progress and help our community develop and redevelop itself for the future. And I think, yeah, this is sort of one of the big takeaways from our discussion today is this new pay for performance model, community involvement model. Have you heard of any other place that's doing something quite like this? So I can only talk about what we've done. I'm sure there are other places that are doing versions of it. And I introduced a shared economy because the water world is a little bit of a, um, it's not as progressive as Silicon Valley. It is a little bit behind the curve from a technology. So even we take something like you said, which is a traditional private marketplace spec building, pay for performance is general market economics. You provide a performing product and the customer pays for that performing product and you're at risk to providing a performing product. In the water world, it quickly becomes a contract, pay for performance contract. But to your point, the philosophy of private sector providing value in public sector, then purchasing once that value is provided, versus public sector guaranteeing that they're gonna purchase it and then negotiating around it. That's a huge shift. But uh, Los Angeles, we are running a um, green street bundle with Geosyntec and Los Angeles Sanitation where we're doing four green streets and we're providing the upfront capital so that we can bring greater competition of local small businesses. So we've been able to attract just on a small 10 million plus bundled four green streets we've been able to bring 10 additional local small businesses that didn't work in stormwater before. And we've been able to do that because by providing the upfront capital, we're able to reduce the float of payment, the duration for payments, get better pricing, expedite the schedule, and we only get paid back if we deliver the streets per the specifications and functionality and some follow-on maintenance by the Los Angeles Sanitation. The uh, city of Salinas, in Monterey County, California, has also just selected us to develop a program just like this for them to meet their regulatory compliance, but do it in a way they don't have a tremendous amount of money. They're not a wealthy community, but do it in a way that they make sure they're getting the value before they spend their money. So as communities that are 
listening to this water sessions are looking for those solutions. This is a, a new model of trying to figure out because ultimately a lot of these municipalities are saying, how do I pay for all this and how do I get it done? They've got the vision, but this provides them that sort of approach. I'm going to zero in on a little bit uh, coming back on the Milwaukee aspect of things. Mm-hmm. And I know that it's early in the ball game for you on this one. You've just started with them early in 2020. But you've sourced and assessed about 100 different projects that, again, weave into becoming part of this larger jigsaw puzzle. Can you explain or describe one of those projects? And I know that there's something going on with Alverno College, which is a local Catholic women's college on the the south side of Milwaukee. And you talked about also, you know, in Prince George's County of how you were engaging with community businesses and obviously universities. This project is an example of that community involvement. And I suspect also not necessarily just this one, but others where you're providing an avenue for employment for people too. Describe some of the, you know, one of the projects or two of the projects taking place in Milwaukee. Yeah, no, the Alverno project is really exciting. So I'll give you the context. So we've gone out and February is when the commission approved the Fresh Coast Protection Partnership, which is between MMSD and Corvius. We've sourced with the community, with the local businesses, we've sourced 146 potential projects. We've identified 78 of them being feasible per the program requirements. And we continue to whittle that down to about 56 that are financially right now viable. And we're starting to identify the first couple, like five or 10 that we will actually start breaking ground on. And Alverno College is on that list. And Alverno College, not just for the gallons, it's estimated to to treat about a a million gallons. Like you talked about, there's institutions that are universities, local school districts, not just pure private sector, but that are large property owners and have great opportunities. And so the Alverno College one has has a couple of great things. It's uh, from a technical standpoint, it's a wetland development. We like it because it's got the possibility and talking with them to have the access and to move very fast within two months. So a lot of this is also just about the speed to be able to get projects going. We're going to integrate curriculum and an outdoor classroom. Every time we do a project, we're looking to maximize the community engagement. And all these costs are all part of that per gallon cost that are in there. So these extra community features, benefits, value adds, triple bottom line are still, at the end of the day, we're in a market where we only get paid for on a per gallon basis. And that includes all the costs included. There is no additional costs outside or payments outside of the per gallon price. And so the the goal is for it to be a community amenity, for it to be a functioning preventative ounce of prevention for a pound of cure for MMSD, but to actually be a community amenity for Alverno College. And Alverno College, we're super excited about because they're, like you said, they're a women's college focused on advancing minority women in STEM. So what greater platform of, we're going to do eight and a half million gallons, but for a million of those gallons to opportunities to be a outdoor classroom curriculum as an amenity for a women's college focused on advancing minority women in STEM. And it's been sourced by a local design engineering firm. It's being designed and engineered by a local design engineering firm, and it's going to be constructed by a local contractor in the Milwaukee community. And that's super exciting. And that's just one project that will be part of the, we estimate probably about 30 plus projects to meet that 8 million gallons or 20 plus projects to meet 8 million gallons. It's a dynamic project. It's a fun project. It's a meaningful project to put in there. And doing projects like this as part of our production line of projects to bring back to MMSD, help spur more projects. You know, as people hear it, we end up getting an influx of more people identifying properties that they would like, as they understand what this is, that they would like projects done in their property. Because they all start, you know, realizing is it helps my home, helps my business, and I want to be a part of it because if I can keep water out of my basement, it's going to save me an aggravation and money as well. And, you know, every ounce comes gallons and that soon becomes a million gallons and you're having a big, huge impact. And then to your point again, but there's still economic efficiency. This isn't just a one project, one hit, one shot. It's part of X number of projects to get to eight and a half million gallons as a pilot to then go to the next level of 20 million gallons with MMSD and really put them on the true trajectory 
to get to their 750 million gallon goals, but get them on that trajectory in a system that their marketplace accepts, not trying to do it as an as a capital program being issued out by a public government, but really doing it as a public government program that's a catalyst to get the marketplace to engage and really help drive it. And that reduces the burden for MMSD significantly. That's great. And in many ways, uh, you know, I guess I started thinking about now Carvias as being the Uber of stormwater. You've become this new innovator out there. So, Greg, this has been great to talk to you. I've certainly learned a lot about the new business model and approach to dealing with all the rain that we get. Any final thoughts that you might have, Greg? You know, the the final thought I'll say is, uh, while everything I talked about is really exciting, I do want to stress that progressive markets, you know, even beyond just early adopter markets like Milwaukee that have, you know, innovative institutions like MMSD, but also resources like the Water Council and innovative resources and, and driving that, these all are really important ingredients in a marketplace to help it be receptive to these potential changes that you can to look at how the, the construct works. And I thank you. We're excited to be partnered with the Water Council. And it really is important work that you guys are doing to get the community to really put a focus on it and allow for these types of innovations to, to take root, not just in delivery, but in technologies and investments. It's all very important in making a market more investable to bring more capital to it. Well, thanks very much. So we've been talking, Greg Canito. I'm going to let you back. I've taken too much time. you got a lot of miles to deal with, but it's been really a pleasure. And thank you very much for, uh, for joining me and being part of this water session. Yes, thank you, Dean. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today. Special thanks to our series sponsor, Rexnord. Additional support is provided by Corvius, along with Fund for Lake Michigan and the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. Don't miss a beat. Subscribe to Water Sessions today.